Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been tuning in this month, you know that it has been jam-packed as always. I think by the time uh, November comes to an end, we'll have hosted 50 or 60 live events with scientists, explorers, adventurers, and conservationists from all around the world. So if uh, you still want to get in on some of the action, you can head over to exploringbytheseat.com. You can find all the events that are coming up, how to register to tune in live, tune in afterwards via YouTube. Of course, we love to see your classrooms joining in. Now, we, for the last, oh, probably close to two years now, we've been connecting with the Duke Lemur Center and hosting all kinds of events from the Lemur Forest, from the fossil archives, learning about conservation taking place uh, in Madagascar. And we have a great event in store for today. So for those who might not know, the Duke Lemur Center was founded uh, in 1966 on the campus of Duke University that's in Durham, North Carolina. It's a world leader in the study, care, and protection of lemurs, which are Earth's most threatened group of mammals. So they have more than 200 animals across 14 species. It houses the world's largest and most diverse populations of lemurs outside of their native Madagascar. Today, we're gonna to be joined by Dr. James Herrera. He is a research scientist and program coordinator of the Duke Lemur Center Saba Conservation, uh, as he's going to share with us some stories about Malagasy conservationists racing to save Madagascar's unique species. So let me bring James in live with us now. Hey, James, how are we doing today? Great, thank you. How about you all? Good, good. It's great to have you joining us. We've got classrooms across North America live on camera with us, tuning in via YouTube. We're looking forward to learning more about lemur conservation. Uh, and then, of course, I have a feeling there'll be lots of questions for you afterwards. Great. Well, I'm really excited to be able to share uh, with everyone and be back on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Awesome. Well, James, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit, and then uh, we'll continue with a little Kahoot quiz and some questions. Great. Can you see my screen all right? There we go. All right. Well, thank you again, everyone. Thank you for the invitation to be here. It's a real pleasure to speak with uh, such a broad audience. And, you know, I wanted to talk today about kind of a heavy subject, um, and that's about hunting. And so, you know, it's especially a difficult topic when you're talking about an endangered species like the lemurs. As you mentioned, they're one of the most threatened mammal groups. And they're only found in Madagascar, which means that they are endemic there. And so it's a, a really uh, important and um, timely topic because especially now at this time of the year, there's a, a lot of pressure on natural resources in Madagascar. So to lighten it up a little bit, first I'll take you on a, a quick trip to Marojeji National Park, which is in the northeast region of Madagascar, an area known as the Sava. You can see it's full of lush rainforest that is in these rugged mountains. And that forest is home to a wide range of biodiversity like the famous chameleons, amphibians, uh, snakes, but of course everybody's favorite is the lemurs. There are about 100 different species of lemur and 25 species are found only in this northeastern region. So that means they're also endemic within Madagascar. Among these lemurs are the silky shafaka, which is a type of uh, shafaka that's only found in rainforests. And they're really not very well known because they are so rare. There may only be about 250 individuals remaining in the wild and they've never been kept in captivity before. So it's really important that we protect the natural environments where they live. I mean, aren't they just amazing animals? They're, they're really beautiful, very unique in having this almost all white coat. Some of them have a little more black that you can see there on the shoulders. Um, and you know, they're really important in their ecosystem for a variety of reasons. They're the largest lemur in this uh, habitat. And so that makes them important food for other animals like the top predator in this ecosystem, which is the fusa. And, you know, this is kind of also a flagship species, meaning that it's so iconic from the area that lots of people know it or should know about it, kind of like the pandas and tigers. And that's why we've been supporting a team of Malagasy researchers and scientists who are studying these lemurs in their natural habitat, 
this is uh, Edgar and his team of students, scientists, and also the local forest managers, uh, because we do partner very, very closely with the people that are right at the forefront on the forest edge, who are the people who are really responsible for managing the forest. I've talked about this team a little bit in previous uh, previous presentations, so maybe check back with some of those for some more background. But they're really amazing. They're doing ecological research in the forest, studying the lemurs, how many of them there are, and what kind of habitats do they prefer? What are the trees like in their habitat? Uh, but in addition to the work that they do in the forest, they also spend a considerable amount of time doing um, research and participatory appraisals with the local communities. That means they get into the communities, they live in the villages, they do surveys with different groups of men, women, even children to talk about, you know, what are the environmental issues that people perceive to tell about hunting practices and why people still need to hunt in many areas. And also to, uh, by participatory, I mean, we're engaging the communities to help develop projects that can simultaneously address the challenges of lemur conservation as well as human livelihoods, because we have to remember that Malagasy people, you know, they're, they're a really diverse group of people. There's about 26 different, uh, 26 million people living in Madagascar. They have about 18 different ethnic groups and different linguistic dialects. And they're predominantly farmers. 80% of people are living off the land. They grow their own food, especially rice, like what's shown here. Rice is a really important staple food source. Uh, they eat it almost every day if they can. But Madagascar also produces some of the world's best spices. This is vanilla, believe it or not. And most of the world's high quality vanilla comes from this place in Madagascar, the Sava region. People live traditional livelihoods and they depend on the forest for products like the wood that they use to build homes, firewood to cook their meals, and even hunting wildlife. So it's really important to appreciate these human dimensions when we're talking about conservation. Here, a mother proudly shows off her, her field of rice mixed with beans, corn, there's banana and cassava in the background. And these are smallholder farmers, meaning they only own maybe two or three acres of land. They are trying to grow just enough food to feed their family. There's not really much more to sell in the market. And they report to us that you know 50 to 70% of people don't have enough food to last throughout the year. So they face these challenges of food insecurity. One of the reasons is that the, the farming practices that they use are, are kind of traditional practices that are not very high productivity. And they also involve the use of fire. So it's a, a type of agriculture known as swidden, where the farmers will cut a patch of vegetation and then burn it. And by burning, they, they clear out all the weeds, they um, you know, kill off pest insects, and it gives this boost of ash and char, which gives for a good crop in the first year. And that leads to this really mosaic landscape where you can see down in the lowlands there are these flooded rice fields. On the hills, you can see some areas in black here that are fresh burns. And then after they've farmed rice on the hills, they usually will leave it fallow, meaning they'll just let the natural vegetation grow back. And that's what you see in these light patches of kind of greenish yellow. There are a few patches of forest left here in the lower areas, but then you can see up here on the tree line that there's fires pushing right up to the forest this is actually the boundary of a national park. And in areas where there are no national parks, the deforestation often continues until there's no forest left. And the soil, it really has nothing to hold the soil in place. There are no tree roots that really maintain soil integrity and it just erodes away, leaving these uh, areas of bedrock. Um, just to give you an idea of how uh, prevalent these fires are, each of these red dots is a fire that's been recorded by satellites just between September 1st and November 15th of this year. And as we zoom out so that you can kind of see this scale, it really looks like Madagascar is burning. And so this is actually only 10,000 of the fires, 315,000 fires were recorded, but Google Earth couldn't handle more than the 10,000 before uh, it became very choppy. So this is another way of looking at that information. All the red is just, you know, that's fires uh, according to each of these little pixels. Here in these different uh, outlines, you can see those national parks where the fires are pressing right up to the very edge. Lemurs are also sometimes kept as pets. As you can see here, this lemur is, you know, just kind of tied up by a string around its waist and it's eating some moringa leaves, which is 
not its proper diet. These animals are very difficult to take care of, and they often just kind of die and end up in the cooking pot. Hunting for the express purpose of eating is also very common. Uh, these are snare traps, which have caught a dwarf lemur as they walk across this little log bridge. And some lemurs, like the eye eye, are also killed out of superstition. Some people believe that they're a bad luck omen, and if you don't kill them, something bad will happen to your family. So that's just part of the tradition. And there was a recent study that actually estimated over 355,000 lemurs may be hunted every year. Uh, Courtney Borgerson and her colleagues uh, did surveys with households all around Madagascar. And, you know, on average, each household maybe only eats one lemur per year. But when you scale that up, it really does add to a lot of lemurs. And each of these, you know, it's broken down by the different taxonomic groups. So this is not just an issue of lemur biodiversity and conservation, but it's also an issue of human health. So 80% of people are rural farmers, 70% live below the poverty line. And we also see correlates with malnutrition, where almost 50% of people are underweight, 40 to 50% of children under the age of five are stunted, meaning they're too short given their age. And between 36 and up to 50% of women of reproductive age are anemic, meaning they have very low protein and iron, especially, which makes uh, for health complications for the woman, but especially for infant development and fetal development. So I just wanna share with you a little bit about what the Duke Lemur Center does in Madagascar to um, help both uh, with the conservation issues, but also these issues of agriculture and health. and so it's not just about agriculture and, and vegetable farming and things like that, but it's also about the nutrition side of it. So here is Madame Nestorine. She's a researcher and teacher at the regional university. And here she's leading a workshop about what she calls Sakafu Maruluku, food of many colors. So she tries to emphasize how diverse fruits and vegetables of all different colors provide the micronutrients and the vitamins and minerals that people really need for good health. And it's not just about standing up and teaching, it's about hands-on practice. So they gather up the fruits and vegetables that are available around them but they aren't necessarily accessible because people don't have the extra income to go buy these vegetables or they aren't growing them themselves. So we're teaching about how to grow the vegetables and we're also teaching about how to prepare them for nutritious diets, also about uh, hygiene and sanitation because most people get their water from the rivers, so that requires treatment. And then afterwards, everybody gets to have a nutritious and delicious picnic lunch, which always makes me really happy to see people together and, and have a good meal. So I just want to kind of summarize that section. About 12 workshops have been hosted for the farmers in all different villages, and 315 farmers have been trained in these more improved in, uh, you know, agroecology and regenerative agriculture methods. About 40% of those people who have been trained have already adopted these new techniques and are implementing them in their farm. So we follow up with them every month to see who's, who's really uh, engaging with these methods. And for example, Jean Marohavana here is proudly showing off his ginger and corn plantation. And he reports that he's gotten uh, double the yield compared to traditional techniques. We're very proud that 65% 60 of these early adopters are women. Women tend to be underrepresented in opportunities like these training programs, and they're really key to the value chain for all food. 
So it's uh, really, really uh, you know, uh, great that we see these kinds of results. We're also teaching about fish farming as an alternative to bushmeat uh, hunting. So here's an example where we had uh, created a pond with a, a local farming group, but there was a cyclone in 2020, a hurricane that broke the wall of the pond and all the fish got away. So they had to rebuild the pond and they did an excellent job, refilled it, restocked it. And then only three or four months later, they were able to have a, a fish harvest where they harvested 13 kilos of fish. Uh, some of these were distributed to the local farmers who had made their own ponds so they could stock their own pond. But they also had a, a picnic lunch for the kids at the school, which is really uh, great because usually kids don't have school lunch in Madagascar. Uh, I want to talk just really briefly about how we can kind of scale these activities up because, you know, I showed you the extent of the burning across the landscape. We've really got to take this to a, a bigger uh, landscape level. And so that's where we're partnering with multiple different communities, different kinds of institutions and organizations from local communities that just want to restore forest to even the local branch of the military. And they've dedicated land to reforestation where with our support, they were able to plant anywhere from 20 to 30 seedling, 20 to 30,000 seedlings on their land. And here the whole community comes out, school groups, uh, village elders, military and police. You know, down here is the local branch of the Ministry of the Environment with whom we do a lot of collaborations. So they, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of work to plant the trees, but also to protect the plantations. Because with all those fires, you know, we're really worried about a wildfire coming and burning down all our hard work. So here the communities come out and they're clearing what's called a fire break. And this is a, a lane that's maybe, you know, 10 or 12 feet wide. Uh, and they clear all the vegetation, all the fuel that would have otherwise allowed a fire from outside to burn into the reforestation area. And just to show how effective these fire breaks are, this is one of our partners I'm going to tell you more about in just a moment who, you know, he made this fire break right around his land just in time before his neighbor to the right burnt all their forest and all their land. So without this fire break, there was a real risk that the fire could have just spilled over into our, our partner's land here. It's a really critical maintenance set. Uh, 60,000 trees have been planted just in 2021 alone as part of this program uh, with our six, five or six different communities. And we have plans to plant over 100,000 more in 2022. We've uh, built new tree nurseries and we've stocked them all with tons of seedlings. So stay tuned because January and February are the planting seasons. I'm going to turn really briefly to environmental education, which is a really fundamental, important part of uh, conservation because, um, you know, the youth are our future. That's why I also love to speak to to school groups via exploring because I don't really get that chance very often. You all are gonna be making the decisions in the future. And so it's really important to learn about these topics. So here is Everard Beneswavana, he's our education specialist. And he has dedicated his hard earned uh, salary to creating a, uh, a, 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 an interpretive center that he calls the New Generation School Garden. And he hosts school groups to come and learn about the environment. He and his uh, teaching assistant use a variety of teaching tools because everybody learns in different ways. Here they're using a, a visual aid called the Kit Madere, which allows them to show and tell as they give their lesson plan about uh, sustainability and environment. They teach about the local flora and fauna, so the animals that we find in the Saba region, like the lemurs. Even though these uh, school kids, you know, they, they grow up with lemurs kind of in their backyard, you know, they don't really get that many opportunities to go out into the pristine forest where they'll really find those silky shifakas. And so many kids don't know about the diversity of species they find in Sava region. So this is an opportunity for them to learn about them. Um, they use coloring books and different kinds of activities to learn and engage with the topics. Here, uh, these educational pages, they come in English and Malagasy. Each kid colors in their page. And then they make a poster, which they hang on the wall. And then each child, uh, teaches the others about what they learned. So it's really a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. Everybody gets outside and engages with nature. They plant trees that uh, Everard raises in the nursery. They plant in the garden uh, and they use nature journaling as a way to um, really engage with the information. They can draw the different plants and animals that they're learning about, which ones are their favorites. 
Uh, we do a, a scavenger hunt where they have to collect leaves of all different sizes and shapes and draw them and describe them. And uh, here I'm just going to show another quick video that illustrates a little bit more about the education program. So as part of this educational program, over 1,300 children were reached just in 2021 alone via Evrard, Lantu, and also our partners at another educational uh, interpretive center called Makulin. So we're really, really proud of this program and we want to see it continue to grow because we know that this is a great way to reach people and, and inform people about biodiversity. <clears throat> so just with that, I want to mention some of the future directions that we're taking. We're going to be expanding on these environmental education programs by starting what we're calling the Mobile Interpretive Center. So Everard is packing all our materials into the truck and he's taking uh, this education plan on the go. Um, we know that there's thousands of schools and children that still need outreach and they're really, really far in the remote countryside. So we want to be able to reach those people that need it most. We're going to be leading more advanced workshops in vanilla agriculture, how to incorporate um, this very lucrative, lucrative cash crop into their agriculture, as well as increasing poultry husbandry. So things like chickens to help with an alternative to hunting lemurs. We're going to continue to expand our collaboration with the regional university called CURSA, which is where those researchers and lemur conservationists are from that I was mentioning, and with our partners to continue to restore over 200 acres uh, through those uh, reforestation programs that I was mentioning. And with that, I just really want to quickly thank my, my co-workers at the DLC. I couldn't do any of this work without them. Um, the, the amazing staff, teachers, and students at the local regional university, and also Ricardo Morales here, who made all the wonderful video footage you're seeing. We thank our sponsors, without whom we couldn't make, make any of this work possible. And of course, to thank you for, for tuning in. So with that, I'll stop and take any questions. All right. Awesome, James. Thanks so much for sharing that with us today. I think, you know, we hear a lot about conservation and what needs to happen. And I think, you know, at Duke, you guys are doing it the right way. You're not just telling people what not to do, but you're giving options and, you know, ways to, to make a living, ways to support families. Because at the end of the day, I think most people want to protect their backyards, their communities, uh, but sometimes they just don't have a choice. It's about survival. So I think the work uh, that you're doing with Duke and your team is, is incredible. Thank you so much for sharing it with us today. Thanks very much, Joe. Yeah, we, we feel the same way. We, we feel like we learned very early on that you can't just, you know, put a fence around the park and tell people don't go in there. It's, it's, a, it's not fair to them and it's um, only going to make situations worse. All right. Well, what we're going to do now before we jump into some Q&A action is we're going to do a little Kahoot quiz and see how well our students were paying attention today. So if you visit Kahoot.it, <clears throat> excuse me, you will find the spot to enter your PIN number. You can see I've got the pin number up there on the screen as well. If your classroom has one-to-one -one technology, so iPads or Chromebooks at your seat, you can join like that. If not, 
uh, your teacher can pop it up on the front of the classroom and you guys can shout out your answers that way. So I'm going to share my screen here and let's get uh, the quiz going. All right, you should be seeing my screen. Whoa, lots of students joining right now. Uh, you should see that up there right now. Uh, the pin number is there, 170-8931. Uh, and then we're going to give it another couple seconds here, and then we will take uh, things live. This is really cool. This is a new, uh, a new tool you've been using. Yeah, we started using it uh, with the events in September, and it's just a fun way for students to interact and we always like to see who comes out on top. I love it. All right. Well, uh, let's get things going here. I'm going to start the quiz. Uh, like I mentioned, 20 seconds for each question. Here we go. So question one, about how many species of lemur are there? Did James say less than 25, 50, around 100? Uh, or 200 species of lemurs. Wow, lots of folks tuning in. That's great. Yeah. All right. Most went with around 100. What is it, James? Somewhere in the neighborhood of 110, 111 so far? Yeah, I usually just go with 100 because it rolls off the tongue. But someone yeah. are saying I think it's about 112 when you also consider like the subspecies. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's see where our leaderboard is right now. So Dazia is in first place, but it's close. Let's see what happens on question two. What does endemic mean? Was it that they're found all over the world? Was it they're found nowhere else in the world? Was it that the animal is endangered or that the animal is extinct? So what does endemic mean? Okay, well, uh, 44 students went with found nowhere else in the world. That's absolutely correct. So species like the lemur are endemic because they're only found in Madagascar and even just found in certain spots, certain forests in Madagascar. Uh, oh, we got a shift. Lexi t jumped into first place on the scoreboard. Let's see what happens in our third question. How do most people make a living uh, in Madagascar? Was it farming? Was it hunting? Tourism or construction? How did most people make a living? I think James mentioned about 80% uh, of the population. All right, by far, most students went with farming. If we take a look at our leaderboard, Miss F, so this might be a classroom here, has taken the lead. And let's see what happens on our final question. Anything can happen. What are some threats that lemurs are facing? Fires from farming, hunting, habitat loss from deforestation, or all of the above? Okay, 84 students went with all of the above, which is correct. Let's take a look at our leaderboard in third place, Lexi. Good job, Lexi. Second place, Willie Snipes. And first place. All right, looks like Ms. F's class was able to hold on to first place. Let's come back from that screen share now. First of all, thanks everybody for joining in and playing Kahoot with us today. It's always fun to see the students taking part. Uh, and James, what do you say? Let's do a little Q&A action. Yeah, that'd be great. Great job, everybody. I'd love to see everyone was really uh, engaging with the material. Okay. So I want to uh, shout out to uh, Miss James crew in Kingston, Ontario, some grade sixes. They're in the call, but their devices didn't connect. So if they use the chat sidebar, they'll be able to send me in some questions. So I'll keep an eye out for those questions. But let's start meeting some of our live groups. So I want to go to Chicago first. We've got some third graders hanging out with us in Chicago. Let's bring them into the call. Hey, third graders, how are you doing today? Good. Hola. 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 <laughs> Good to see you today. Who's got a question for us? Hi. 
Hi. Hello. How long is the average I.I.'s finger? How long is their finger? I'm going to have to look that one up for you. <laughs> All right. I really, I really should know that one. It, it's a very, you, it, you know more about lemurs, I think, than most because, uh, you know, it's, it's a very specialized finger. It's very long and skinny, although it's not that much longer than the other, um, the other fingers, but it's, it's very unique in that it's got a ball and socket joint. And so it can swivel just like our shoulder does. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to look up the actual, make sure the answer is right for that. It's, it's, they say it's about two thirds the length of its hand. Um, which makes it, you know, the majority of the hand. But um, let me get the right answer for you. Thank All you. right. Yeah. Looks like our third graders in Chicago have definitely been thinking about lemurs. And I just think it's so cool how lemurs have evolved to fill so many different parts of the habitat. So the eye is kind of like a woodpecker using that uh, that finger to kind of feel for little hollow spots mm -hmm. and then find uh, those grubs. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. All right, third graders, we're coming back your way. So get another question ready for us. Uh, Miss Forsyth crew is joining us. Let me bring them live into the conversation. Oh, I think we're just catching them right at the end of their period. Maybe they can squeeze a question in. Sorry, the bell just rang for lunch. Okay, well, if you have any questions, Miss Forsyth, pop uh, them into the chat for us. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, while you James, do that, here, can you see this image of the I.I.'s finger here? Yeah, let me bring that up there. Thank you to the DLC crew, uh, especially Carrie Whitman, who shared this with us. But there's that finger there. There's that long middle finger. You can see it's actually, well, it's the, the third digit. This is the thumb. This is the pointer finger. That's the middle finger that's really long and skinny. So it's actually the same length as the others, but it's just so weird and long and skinny like that. Yeah, really different from the other digits on the hand. Very cool. Let's bring in another class here. Mrs. Stone's crew is hanging out with us. They are joining us from Cambridge, Ontario today. How are we doing, five sixes? How are you guys doing? Good. Okay. Layla has a question for you. Um, so with oh, the... sorry, my friends. Zip it and left your Layla. Thanks. <laughs> when like the deforestation happens, can the how do they know right where the national parks are if there's no fence? There's no fence, but there is a, um, like a, they, they've cleared basically a trail all the way around the park and on the, like facing the park, they paint the trees red and they'll put signs that say, this is the national park. You're not supposed to go in. You're not supposed to cut trees or burn forest, but that's actually a, a really great point. Thank you for bringing that up because that's one of the challenges for a lot of folks, you know, in some of these national parks, that limit is really well maintained. So it's very clear to you know outsiders who uh, where the park limit is, but in many places it's not so clear, and that's kind of the argument a lot of local people will make is that you know it, it wasn't really we didn't agree where the limit should have been, or it wasn't made clear to us where the limits were, so they didn't even know they were in the national park when they were cutting trees. It's a really it's a really important issue, and I think uh, you raised a great point there. Thank you. All right, and I think sometimes too. You know, even if they, you know, know the boundaries, they're, you know, when, when you need something, when you need something for your family or resources, you know, you're not going to worry too much about the boundaries, I think. That's true. Okay. Um, uh, Mrs. James Class sent us in a question here. They're curious about uh, the age of lemurs. They're wondering um, what's kind of an average lifespan for a lemur. Great. Thank you for that question. So lemurs are pretty unique in having very long lives compared to other mammals that are about the same size. So there's the mouse lemur, which is among the smallest primates in the world. They're um, just about, you know, one or two ounces and they can fit in the palm of your hand. They're basically the size of a mouse. You know, that's why they get their name. A mouse usually only lives two, three, maybe four years or a rat of a similar size. Mouse lemurs can live 20 or more years. So that's really something that's unique about primates compared to other mammals, but especially these little lemurs. And then some of the larger lemurs like the Shifaka, they've been recorded to live 30 plus years. Even the II, some of the II here at the DLC are more than 30 years old. Okay, great question. I'm gonna duck over to YouTube now. Ms. Morningstar's class is tuning in with us. 
and they're wondering, uh, it's kind of a broad question, but they're wondering how lemurs find food in their natural environment. How do lemurs find food? Well, it's, it's a broad question and something that keeps ecologists and uh, primatologists you know, busy for decades now. Uh, we're really interested in understanding what cues the lemurs use to uh, find their food. So many of the lemurs are frugivores, which means they eat fruit. And, um, you know, some of them, like the uh, red, the rough lemurs, they are so dependent on fruit, it's like 90 to 99 percent of their diet. And fruit is not, you know, just distributed everywhere in the forest. So some researchers have even uh, hypothesized or they, they're testing the idea that uh, lemurs have like a mental map of the habitat in their head that they remember where the trees are and they know when the trees are going to be ripe so that they are not just wandering randomly in the forest. They're going very specific places. Um, lemurs are, are primates, just like humans are primates. And so you probably know humans have color vision, or at least most people do. We can see red, green, and all the different colors of the spectrum. But many other mammals, they don't have that. They just see black and white or gray. Lemurs are a mix. Some lemurs can see colors, some lemurs cannot. And so there's also been research to try to understand, is there an advantage to color vision? Can they find food better than animals that don't have color vision? And it turns out that the ones that have color vision, yeah, they can see red and green. So that's an advantage. But the lemurs that don't see color, they actually can, um, they can distinguish camouflaged objects better. So imagine like a green fruit that's a little bit darker green on a light green background. They can tell that apart even better than a, an animal that has color vision. So there's lots of research about that. Um, lemurs are also a little bit unique compared to other primates in that they rely a lot on odor. So they can probably smell the fruit trees from very far away. Now they also eat a lot of leaves and leaves, many people think, oh, leaves are all over in the trees, but not all leaves are considered or created equal. Some of them, especially the older leaves, they've built up lots of chemicals in them that even have poisons to protect the plant. Whereas the young leaves, those are more nutritious and have less poison. So the lemurs are very selective. They don't just go eating leaves at random. They're going for those young leaves. It's a really great question because it's something that keeps primatologists, you know, busy for decades now. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it is a great question. I think it's, it's amazing the ability that primates have to know when certain things are ripening or fruiting in different spots and they arrive at just the right times. It's, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we're going to swing through our groups one more time. Uh, I see some great questions coming in the chat as well. So let's jump to our crew in Chicago and see if they have one more question for us. Naya, uh, Naya do you have a question? Yes? I have um, No, wait. Naya, you asked last time. So let's go with Ella this time. Yes, it did. You asked the question. Yes. Hi, Ella. Hi. Um, uh, um, no. no, I, I, um, what can we, um, can I, I lemurs be, can I, I lemurs have different color eyes? Do I, I lemurs have different colored eyes? I think they're almost always that orange amber color. Uh, almost all lemurs have eyes that are like that orangey amber, but there's a few, like there's one species in particular that's called the blue eyed black lemur and you can imagine where he got its name, they actually have blue eyes. Uh, they're really fantastic, especially because the, the body is very dark black and then they have these stunning blue eyes that pop out. And um, there's also the Indri, which sometimes has bluish greenish eyes, but the eye eye I think almost always has red eyes or orangish. All right, I can see our crew is very curious about the eye eye. Have you been studying uh, that lemur? Did you look that lemur up today or earlier? No, we just, that's like pro probably like the most one we know in this class, most likely. Gotcha. <laughs> cool. Very, very cool. All right, I'm going to bring Miss Stone's class back in because they sent a few really great questions. We want to give them a chance to, so, to ask them. So, but since you're so interested, can I share a really quick, really cool video of the II that the, sure. the lemur team uh, shared with me? Yeah, if you have it handy, sure. And then we'll bring Miss Stone. Sorry, Mrs. Stone, we'll get you back in in just a moment. Yeah, I swear I'll give you another minute just... Since, yeah, uh, you, you do have eyes at the lemur center. Um, that's right. Yeah, very cool. 
So this one was shared with me. I'm very grateful to Grayson. Um, can you see that okay? Yep. Is that coming through all right? Yep, looks good. So this is a stump that the a tree stump that was cut because they were doing some maintenance around the grounds. And the keeper actually said, let's take this stump and we'll give it to the IIs. And they drill holes. And you see her licking now. They've drilled holes into the wood where they put like honey. And you see how she uses that finger. There's either honey or sometimes peanut butter or jam in those holes. And she'll, she'll scurry around smelling, looking, peeling. And she'll chew into the wood to make the hole a little better. She'll use that little finger to stick into the um, into the stump, and that's how she can get the honey out. All right, really cool. It's neat to get those looks because uh, it would be so incredibly difficult to find them in the wild. So getting kind of that that glimpse is pretty cool. Yeah, they're yeah, they're super rare in the wild. Look at how cool they are. Oh, let me bring that up. <laughs> uh, sorry, I got I got to show that part again. <laughs> Aren't they Very just so cool. cool? All right, I'm going to bring Miss Stone's crew in uh, and give them a chance here. There we go. All right, go ahead, Antoine. Um, oh, quiet, friends. What is the average length of a lemur? The average length. Length? Like the body length? Yeah. Well, that's a that's a hard one to answer because lemurs come in very, very small and very, very large. So the average is just kind of in between. I would say, you know, the typical lemur, like a brown lemur, they're about the size of a cat, if that helps you kind of put it in perspective. I think they're I'm going to I'm going to just make a very broad generalization, maybe three feet long, four feet, maybe if you include the tail between the size of your average cat and a small dog. But then also keep in mind, you've got those mouse lemurs that literally just the palm of your hand. I mean, that's what, eight inches long. <laughs> are, so they, are, they okay. aggressive to, are they aggressive to humans, we wanted to know? It depends. You know, lemurs have personality. Um, some lemurs, you know, all lemurs are wild. We'll start by saying that. All lemurs are wild animals. And when you're, you know, in general, you don't even get to interact with the wild animals because they're either afraid of people. So they just take off or they're just so high up in the trees that they, you know, don't bother with us. However, they will be aggressive to defend themselves if they have to be. So like when lemurs are caught in a trap or something like that, they will bite. They've got very sharp teeth. Um, people who have tried to keep them as pets have frequently reported being bitten and scratched, you know, because they are wild. It's like trying to take a, you know, any other wild primate out and, and make it into a pet. They really don't do well. Um, but, you know, in general, if, if you leave them alone up in the trees, they don't even pay attention to us because they realize we're no FUSA. We're not going to come and get up into the trees and, and try to hunt them that way. All right. Uh, another question here from Miss James class uh, in the chat. They'd like to know, uh, do lemurs have any adaptations for the heat? Very cool question. Thank you for asking that. The lemurs have lots of really unique adaptations. Um, actually... Let me see if I can uh, look this up for you. But the, every year in October, um, there's the uh, World Lemur Festival. And for the last four years, that's that's been a, a big you know party, basically, in honor of lemurs. And um, one of the, you know, they always have a theme for, for the different uh, events. And so this year's theme was actually, uh, this was the picture they used. Can you see that all right? So this is a picture that they used where it looks like three shafakas that are hugging uh, a baobab tree. Well, if you if we can follow the story, this actually. Um, oh, I thought it gave me the whole article. That this story basically comes from a, a true event where a researcher. Um, oh no, that's the Twitter. <laughs> a researcher found the lemurs all together sitting on the ground hugging this tree. And they, literally, they later did research to show that the base of this tree was significantly colder than the, uh, the rest of like the ambient temperature. So the lemurs were down there like kind of clutching onto a, a little cooler that would help to bring their body temperature down. One of the adaptations they have, because lemurs also live in deserts, 
the, the south and southwest of Madagascar is extremely hot and dry. Those Shifaka, some of them have never even been observed to drink water because there is no available water or it's so limited that they get all their water from the leaves they eat. So that's one adaptation to, to deal with that desert-like environment is just they have super specialized uh, ability to extract water even when there's so little available. They can hug the trees. <laughs> um, but a lot of the, noc the lemurs that live in the deserts are nocturnal. So they avoid the heat of the day by sleeping and only come out at night. And they sleep in tree holes that are actually quite insulated. So people have actually put temperature loggers inside the tree where the lemurs sleep and outside and can show that inside the tree maintains a, a more stable, cool temperature compared to the outside. Some of the animals will even just go into a period of inactivity that's called torpor or hibernation because at that, you know, some of those hot forests, there's also very little food during certain times of the year. So to avoid this stressful environment, they just go into hibernation and they come out when the rains start. All right. Well, James, I want to start off with a huge shout out to our crews who joined us live via YouTube, to our classrooms who joined us uh, live in camera spots. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today, playing Kahoot with us, sending in your great question. I'm going to squeeze one more quick question in here because this is an interesting one. We know that sloths can swim. What about lemurs? Any evidence of lemurs swimming? Very interesting question. I don't know of any records of lemurs swimming. And often they're kept in zoos where there's like a, a flooded moat around their little islands and they don't they don't go into the water to try and like get off their little island. So I don't think they like to swim, but I'm sure if they really, really had to, they might have. But I don't think they like to. All right. So I do want to give a shout out as well to the Gardner uh, Foundation who have sponsored our month of events this month. Um, do check out their website. Uh, incredible program giving awards to amazing uh, science medical breakthroughs. And we've hosted a great series of events uh, with some of those scientists and some of those researchers exploring cells, uh, concussions, and all kinds of things about uh, the human body. So do check out some of those recorded events as well. Do spend a little time at the Duke Lemur Center. So there's a website there. You can check out uh, some of the work that's happening there uh, and probably dig a little bit deeper into some of the conservation uh, programs as well. And James, I have to as well, thank you. It's always a great time to be able to host uh, anybody from Duke Weaver Center, but we enjoy our events and learning more about the people uh, and you know the, the way of life and how you're able to support um, livelihoods and also protect the forest and the lemurs at the same time. Thank you very much. I always appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with the with such a broad audience. I really uh, always like coming on exploring and hearing the questions you all ask. I love to see how you're all using technology to engage lots more people and and make learning fun. So thank you all for the invitation and I hope to be back on soon. All right. Excellent. Well, thanks again, everybody. Don't forget to visit uh, Exploring by the Sea to check out more events and we will see you uh, hopefully in the coming weeks. So have a great day, everyone. Thanks. Bye.